Hello, my name is Rich Howard, owner of Architectural Builder Supply. This video is to bring you a closer look at the Rickson. This is their part number H117-3-587. This is a, a fairly common pivot. We don't sell it nearly as much as we would, um, you know, a, a 128 or a 117 or certainly a 370 um, sticking in the center hung family uh, of pivots. Uh, but every once in a while, someone needs a pivot that's going to swing a real big hammer, meaning it's going to carry a lot of weight. And the H117 um, is that big hammer. There are, there, there's one H117, uh, there's two different ways to do it in terms of the arm. There's the uh, end load arm, which is common, and then the side load arm. This is a side load arm. Very typical, easy to understand difference of why you would use one over the other, and we'll discuss that. First, let's just go over some basic dimensional properties. We'll talk about why, you'll, why you would use it, where you would use it. We're going to do a fairly deep dive into the installation instructions, the template, the cut sheet. We're going to do a painfully deep dive into the radius that it, uh, the instructions say that you need. Um, and then we're going to uh, wrap it up. So let's get started. Some basic dimensional properties for the H117. Uh, the width of the plate, or of the body itself, about five and a quarter. Its, it's length is about five inch. The spindle from the plate itself looks like it's about, and these dimensions aren't really anything, any reason uh, to pay too much attention to. I'm just putting the size of this into some sort of context. About two and a half inch. Um, it has these uh, lugs that are here on the bottom. I see that they've changed this design. These used to be curved in the past. I can't explain why they're not curved anymore, but we'll talk more about that. Real heavy spindle here that is probably every bit of half inch. Every bit of. Yeah, it's 5 eighths. It's way more than that. So it's 11 sixteenths. Um, really large spindle. And this model also features a thrust bearing, and that thrust bearing um, is meant for periodontally axial loads where you're not going to have any torque, but it's going to carry a lot of weight in that sort of axial um, movement or, or, or direction, I suppose. That spindle is 0.6. 88 by 0.692, so basically, basically 11 16 square. Um, this little rubber cap down here just keeps that clean. Okay, uh, let's look at the rest of the items uh, in the box, and then we'll we'll dive into the um, why you'll use it. This is the arm. The arm itself is fairly heavy. This entire unit, I don't know the weight of this unit, but I'm, uh, I will um, add that information. About nine inch in length on the arm. The overall height, about an inch and a half. The thickness is about an inch and uh, three eighths. Substantial arm here. This is the side load arm. We're gonna talk about that in a moment. The end load arm would have the cap back here and the screws or the machine screws to hold it on. Um, typical difference for this, easily explained. The next thing of importance would be the top pivot. This is an H340 top pivot. This is the component that goes into the header, and there's a uh, finished plate for this. Then this is the arm uh, that goes into the top of the door. Let's put a couple of basic dimension pro uh, properties on this. This is going to be the type of uh, pivot, walking beam pivot, where you're uh, able to put your screwdriver in there and draw that pivot pin back up and in, and I'll get a screwdriver and we'll demonstrate that in a moment. Overall length of the header portion, and th I'm showing it without the faceplate. Okay, this unit is in a 613 oil rub bronze finish. That's what it looks like. Okay, because when you look when you look up at the header, that's what you're going to see. Okay. Let's pull that aside. Now well, let's let's take a dimension of the faceplate. About six and three quarter. About an inch and a quarter. Um, let's grab that screwdriver and let's show you how that is uh, is done. Customers will call and say, "I have no idea how to get this pivot out of here." Overall length of the door portion seven and a quarter. 
the width about an inch and a quarter or so. And um, yes, I remember the first time I was studying it and I said, well, it's not magic. <laughs> it has to come out somehow. So let's, let's take a look at that. So the question is how you retract that pin. And all it is is that screwdriver. And as I turn that, you can see I'm drawing the, the pin up. Okay, so whenever you're servicing the door or you're doing initial installation, it's simply what it is. So the pivot will be in the floor, the door will be brought in and set down on top of that pivot. Your pin is retracted up into the housing. You get the door in place, this is a two-person job. Who knows how many people uh, on a pivot that will carry a thousand pound load. Um, but I've serviced floor closers and it's, it's two people. You've got a big pivot up there. So you get the door in place, start drawing that pin down. That pin is going to get drawn into the top of the door here, and that's how you'll secure it. Um, to complete our visual tour, let's take a look at the finish plate for the uh, bottom end. Overall length, about six and a quarter, six and five sixteenths. Overall width, about five and a quarter. Very thin material, you know, whatever. Um, Let's play. How thick is that material? Uh, I'm going to say 42 thousandths. Mm. No. 52 thousandths. The kit is good. Uh, am I cheating? No. You know, am I capable of making a pretty educated guess? Yes. Why 52 thousandths? Well, it's probably not 50 thousandths, um, because that would be nominally what it probably is. Um, and why I say that is because this is a typical piece of sheet metal that you'll make kick plates out of. So in the industry, you've got kick plates and push plates and other flat goods, stretcher plates, mop plates, armor plates. Those are 50 thousandths, generally. Why wouldn't they use the same material that they would make a kick plate out of for a face plate? Probably would. I mentioned that there's a thrust bearing. There's a thrust bearing and a shim, actually. Um, in the world of pivots, you don't get a lot of um, options when it comes to adjustment. That spacer, they call it, that gets dropped down there. And then your thrust bearing. Could you put more spacers under there? You could. Um, but, you know, a lot of people will shy away from such pivots because uh, of how absolute the dimensions require that you be when you are installing the material. Not only in the net height of the door, which is easily determined. Not only in the width of the door, which we'll go into in excruciating detail in a moment. But, but in the um, vertical axis of pivoting, that line has to be completely... Uh, true plumb level and square. You've got to have a plumb bob drop down and wherever your top pivot pin is it has to be right through the center of the bottom uh, spindle. That ha that, that is an ad that's absolute. That, that must be the case. So people will shy away from pivots in that regard. The need for a spacer I think you'll end up seeing that you'll have over time maybe a little bit of movement in the jam or maybe in the you know, a micro amount of movement and something just stretching out. A spacer is okay to lift that door up a little bit. And occasionally you'll see that as well. And spacers also are encountered when you have a door, and this will obviously double act. But when the door is set in the closed position, your clearance is nice. You have a, you know, 7 16 clearance under the door. It's beautiful. Well, when you open the door, now all of a sudden that floor might do this. Okay? And that doesn't work because now you're hitting the floor out here which you didn't anticipate originally. So you might use a spacer for that. Um, and then the only things that are left, you'll get a decorative cap. To finish that installation. Okay, so you're not going to see that brass called that zinc dichromate you know, if that's what it is, thrust bearing. So you'll get the decorative cap, and then you're going to get a whole mess of fasteners. Okay, machine bolts, 
uh, wood screws, very large wood screws, and then uh, screws for your finished hardware, your plates. Um, and then, of course, hardware for the, the header portion as well is what you're going to get. This material here, these long screws, will be for your bottom arm into the bottom of the door, whether it be wood or steel. It certainly could be steel. Probably isn't steel. And then your top pivot will require its fastener package. Okay. So that's the contents of the box. The thing to do now is to switch and talk about why you're going to use this item. So let's do that now. If you are enjoying this video, please click thumbs up or like, and also please consider subscribing to our channel. Let's move on to the rest of the video. Now, what will you use this unit for? Uh, this is going to be used when you're swinging a very heavy door. Very typically used in applications where you have a custom fabricated door that might be made of steel and glass, wrought iron, things of that nature, exceptionally large wood doors, doors that require the ability to maybe not necessarily double act, but they want to hang, the client wants to hang a very heavy door and do so in the most concealed way possible, and a center hung pivot certainly does serve that end. But a thousand pound door is really where you're going to be dealing with something that's probably custom made. You know, there aren't particle board doors that you can build large enough that will weigh a thousand pounds. There aren't steel doors that will end up weighing a thousand pounds. Um, you know, a, a, a very large lead-lined wood door will certainly get into that range, but you're very likely not going to be using a center-hung pivot for a lead-lined opening at all. Um, so that sort of application. The door you've got, every time someone orders this, it's something custom. This client, uh, they have built a... I'll tell you what it is. What this client has done is they have built a... Uh, safe room. Uh, they've built a bookcase to make it look like it's a bookcase. Uh, the bookcase happens to have a secret. It opens. Well, if a bookcase is going to be a bookcase, let's say the structure itself is 100 pounds or 125 pounds. You throw about 70 hardback novels onto it. Now you're dealing with a different weight of the animal itself. So they want this thing to operate as a normal bookcase, but they need it to be able to swing not uncommon at all. Lots of additional information that you need to take into account when you're dealing with a center hung, when you're swinging something very deep. Um, there is, and I'll, I'll mention it and I'll show it later on the screen view if I don't forget. There is a gentleman by the name of Gary Katz, G-A-R-Y-K-A-T-Z, and he has, I think it's GaryKatz.com, he has a hidden pivot bookcase door, um, you would call it a blog, it's a very long and detailed, extremely well done how to uh, go about using a center hung pivot in it, and I'm looking at it. I'll show it to you. I, will, I, I, I surely won't forget how to go about using this uh, sort of hardware when you're going to be hanging something very odd like a bookcase. Okay, really cool. So an H117 could be an appropriate item for that. I think mostly people are going to use an H, uh, pardon me, a 370 because that's a 500 pound load and most people are saying, well, you know, is it really going to be 500 pounds? Probably not. Um, just depends on what you're going to use it for, how big it is, and what you're going to put into it, I suppose. Very well done. He goes on at length and talks about this material. Okay, so very heavy door is what you're going to use it for, uh, most definitely. Let's go over the description of the item itself when it comes to its extended description. So this is for interior or exterior doors, weight to 1,000 pounds. Rickson says that the door size... Uh, is limited to four foot by eight foot six. I'm very aware of clients using this pivot hardware and others, especially the 370 because it's so common. The 370 is the 500 pound weight limit version of uh, a center hung pivot by Rickson on doors that are five foot, 10 foot, all kinds of stuff. They will very routinely move the pivot point over towards the center of the door or towards the lock edge of the door um, when you have very wide doors, like a five-foot door, 
California Pacific Coast, lots of five foot doors, center hung pivots. They've moved it into the opening 18 inch. So the client will say, well, my door is five foot. They're saying four foot's the maximum. Will this work? What's the weight? Well, probably about 280 pounds. Absolutely, it's going to work. You're moving that pivot point over. Okay. Plus, the pivot can handle 500 pounds um, for four foot. And you're moving that pivot point over. It's going to be fine, and it is every time. So, and it's non handed. Being a center hung pivot, you know, it's just simply going to double act. Now, it doesn't self center, it's not a center uh, hung floor closer. So, it's just a piece of hardware that will swing in and out. The H340 is indeed that pivot that's included. There's also an H345 top pivot that, speaking of California, you might require because it has a longer top pin. More top pin means more engagement in the portion that's in the door itself, meaning uh, a safer environment in an earthquake where, the, where that rectangle is now a parallelogram. They want that door to stay in the opening and not fall out if the house goes like this. Um, that's what the H345 would be used for. Uh, if you needed it, you could certainly upgrade the H117 3 quarter 587 H340 to go to the 345. Not a problem. The bottom pivot is mortised into the floor, and, um, and I'm just tackling these bullet points. So I've had a customer call and order this and say, yeah, you know, I got that pivot, and this was a long, many years ago. I received the pivot, pivot, but what are these? Are these like shipping spacers? What are these things that are on the bottom here? And I looked at the installation instructions and I said, well, they clearly call for grout. Let's back up. I had mentioned earlier that this design had changed. Well, the prior design, and I think the installation instructions still show it, they're curved. The client called and says there's shipping damage. These spacers that were there um, are bent. All four of them, he said, are bent. And I says, that's crazy. I, I was not at that moment aware of what the role of those were. I investigated it. I called Rickson and they said, I had a very enlightening conversation. They said, that pivot is not screwed to the floor. That pivot is only installed when it's set in a bed of concrete. And I said, aha, I don't think the client was anticipating that requirement. Um, and I said, what if he were to, what if the client were to remove the concrete lugs and screw it down? And the tech support gentleman said, this will sound not in accordance with the spirit in which it was originally said, but the message was, do you think screws should be used to secure a thousand pound door is, is, is what the in a very elegant professional way, the tech support gentleman said, um, screws are really not how you would, of course, ever do that at all. And when you have a Rickson floor closer, they're not screwed to the floor. They can be. Uh, they have some thin, uh, thin material, lighter stuff that's put down, I suppose. But everything's put into a bed of concrete. And there's no lateral load, so I'm not concerned about the screws shearing. But when you take a four foot by eight foot six door that can be a thousand pounds and you swing that and that sort of um, mechanical movement or perhaps period, you know, as it, if it were to, you know, rotate around it's a center object, in this case, the vertical axis of pivoting, um, you know, that sort of weight that can move can cause, would certainly cause the stress, the lateral stress on the fasteners. I would imagine that's the concern. And the fact that the lugs were curved or bent, they weren't bent, they're built that way. And it's because it helps keep the unit when you set it in a bed of concrete in place. This design, they've clearly changed it. Um, but I would have guessed at one point, just like an anchor in a hollow metal frame, if your anchor was nothing other than a piece of quarter inch round rod that went into the mortar joint in your mind you can grasp pulling that out of the mortar joint a lot easier than you can something that's corrugated T anchors are corrugated having these lugs bent does make sense to keep that in the concrete um, better uh, from keeping it from moving because of just the different 
direction in which the concrete forces are, are making contact with these lugs. You know, I, I think the logic is, would anyone ever try to pull this up straight out of the floor? Probably not. And maybe bending the lugs they found is just not necessary. That would be my guess. Um, so that's probably why they are now straight. But this is to be set, um, when they say bottom pivot is mortised into the floor, yeah, you're going to need to build, you know, that one job I was referring to, um, oh, it, it was a, a residential application, an old farmhouse, something like that. And uh, I said, well, you've got you've to cut a hole in the floor and you've got to build a box underneath it. Can you, do you have access to the underside of that area? And he says, you know, I think I do. He went downstairs into the basement and looked up and had a clean shot of where he could cut that floor, build himself a two by six box, the right size or whatever he used to build it, secured all of that. He was then able to pour it with concrete and set that pivot in. And that's how that went. And luckily, luckily it worked that way. I've had another client who said, you know, I told him, here's the, I just related the entire conversation I had with Rickson about screws are not how you attach this. I says, um, of course, this is not at all what the factory would ever recommend. And I am, I was aware of, and I am aware of, I told the client, I'm aware of people who have removed those lugs and screwed it to the floor. I said, of course, you defeat the purpose of the fact that it's rated for a thousand pounds. Who knows what it's rated for now? It's technically, from, according to the manufacturer, or, you know, it would probably be rated for zero pounds because you've violated the integrity of the original engineering on the unit. Um, but people have screwed it down to the floor as well. My concern with that is, you know, hearing screws creak in wood, that kind of thing, or wood creak. You know, um, I had someone that I was um, very involved with, uh, and they were doing a project, leading a project where there was a double acting door in a restaurant kitchen. And a stave lumber core door was used because that door took a beating all the time and the logic was stave lumber core is going to be better for that application. Okay, great. Um, stave lumber core is like butcher block. It's pieces of wood that are edge glued together. He assumed that you could, because the door had to be cut down from an 8.0 to a 7.0, he assumed you could just take a circular saw and cut the top of the door and then mortise right to that. Well, the problem with that was you had these little pieces of wood that were only edge glued to each other uh, on an overhead hydraulic door closer. Not Rickson, but it could have been Rickson. Um, and of course, every time that door was cycled, squeak, 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 door had to come down, that whole thing had to be uh, re-railed, uh, re all that wood had to be taken out, a new piece of solid lumber had to go in, glued in, clamped, cleaned up, remortised, rehung. Um, so attaching this via screws could be a long-term, um, oops, I wish I didn't do that. So that's bottom pivot is mortised into the floor in the bullet points. Now, the next bullet point is end load arm for, uh, for a minimum of two inch thick doors. This is a side load arm. The end load arm requires a two inch thick door at a minimum, whereas the 587 side load arm, 587 means side load arm. You're loading it from the side rather than loading it from the end. My hand, my knife edge of the hand here is the spindle. So I should just be doing this. We're loading it from this orientation rather than or this orientation. Why? Well, it turns out the arm, the 587 arm is thinner than the standard arm by a quarter, uh, yeah, by a quarter inch. So that explains why a 587 can go on to an inch and three quarter minimum door thickness where the standard 580, um, the standard H117 three quarter requires a two inch uh, minimum door thickness. If you had inch and three quarter and your arm is inch and five eighths, you know, you've got you've got a sixteenth of an inch nominally, theoretically, a uh, inch and three quarter thick door. When you put a caliper on it, isn't one point seven five? It's one point seven one or one point seven three or I've seen a one point six nine, and you can tell those things are thin. Um, so that's why you'll need a thicker door. But we're doing a five eighty seven inch and three quarter thick, and that's because the width of that arm is inch and three eighths. The template says. 
Pivot point centered in the thickness of the door. Well, that's true. Your door will center over the vertical axis of pivoting. It'll center right over it. If you had a five inch thick door, I, I would see no reason why you wouldn't center it. Um, with the exception of some sort of very odd wall condition that you might be trying to contend with by getting that to move out. Maybe you wanted to, you know, I've never had this experience, but if you had, let's say, a five inch thick door and you biased the pivot point, you know, say two inch towards the inside, as you threw that door open, less of the door would technically be encroaching into the space. So I could see doing it for a reason like that, but it'll be centered over this. Additional, next bullet point, additional surface applied thrust bearing. We talked about the thrust bearing. You've got your spacer or your shim, should you need it. A thrust bearing is literally meant to carry a load in this sort of direction. Okay, that's a big part of where the weight capability of this comes from. And of course your arm is going to go down on here like that. And that will sit on your thrust bearing. Door must have a radius on pivot edge. Door must have radius on pivot edge. Fast forwarding into further into this video, I'm going to go in detail with a screen capture of AutoCAD showing why that's the case. Why, not why it's the case, but what that really means. You've got a cased opening frame. The radius per the template is 2 and 5 eighths. I'll demonstrate that when you have a 2 and 5 eighths radius, you'll maintain, never increase while the door is moving, or decrease an eighth of an inch margin. If your radius changes, you're not going to maintain a true eighth of an inch margin as the door cycles open and closed. If you were to have a square edge door, I also demonstrate what sort of gap you have to be, which is about 5 sixteenths, in order for you not to hit the jam or to maintain an eighth of an inch space. So that 2 and 5 eighths radius on the end of the door is there to maintain an eighth of an inch margin as it cycles open and closed, you know, open, closed, open again, whatever, however, if it's single acting or double acting, that's where that is coming from. Um, pivot point remains constant at two and three quarter from the edge of the door. That refers to the standard H117. When you have the end load arm, the arm's going to come in here, okay, and sit like this. You can't adjust this you can't move everything. And what I mean by that is when you have an end load arm, you're going to be securing the plate onto the end of the arm itself. As you, If you were to take the door, and my pivot is right here. If you were to take the door and move it, and move it way over so you're not at two and three quarter from the jam to the center line, but now you're 18 and three quarter, you would need to route the bottom of the door so that you could get from the heel edge of the door all the way down there to secure these plates because they're on the side. That's why they're saying it's two and three quarter from the edge of the door. You can't change that. Well, let's say you are saying, well, I don't really want to mortise a channel in the entire door and then you use a super long aircraft length screwdriver to tighten that up, uh, you go with the 587 arm. The upside of that is you can easily move that door in relation to the vertical axis of pivoting. The downside of that is you have to make accommodation to get to this plate. You're going to have to notch the face of the door. There is not an elegant solution that Rickson offers for that. You're going to need to come up with a cover plate. Maybe a piece of 50 thousandths that has a couple of holes in it and you attach it. Maybe you are literally... Um, it's a wood door and you're literally going to take a block and you're going to, you know, maybe be able to route it with a panel bit sort of profile and get it stuck up there. Maybe a little dab of glue. You always know it's there. You can pull it off should you need to. You need to have some sort of decorative cover over that um, is simply the bottom line. Because you're not going to be able to, on an inch and three quarter thick door, be able to get a tool up in here and get that rotated 
um, at all is the bottom line. So you'll need to have a cover for the 587 arm. Uh, pivot set features seal bearings for protection against weather and debris. Yeah, I mean, all of this is going to be sealed. That's down here. That cap is there. You're going to have that decorative cap over there. And it's meant for interior or exterior use is the bottom line. So this is all, this assembly is all sealed. Not allowed for use on labeled doors and frames. Absolutely not. This is not a fire rated product. This is not listed. This is not labeled. It's not for use on fire doors. Um, the very nature of a cased opening frame, of course, would violate the principle of a fire rated door without there being a stop. Furnished with wood and machine screws. We demonstrated that earlier. Really long screws, whether regardless of what you're going into. Optional uh, spindle length. They can increase that a half of an inch up to two inch longer than standard so this spindle is inch and seven sixteenths if you recall the thickness of our arm voila just heavy on that not not really it's the same size why in the world would you need an extended spindle well that's really because you have an unusual floor condition where you're going to drop this down below and flooring is going to come over this and it's going to gobble up some of the space here and you need, literally need a longer spindle in order to be able to get that to reach up into the door you've got an unusual uh, I would say clearance you have an unusual clearance because the finished floor hasn't gone in once the finished floor goes in then you'll have a standard clearance um, Obviously, they're going to have to build that thrust bearing up off the floor so that you're sitting on top of this. Uh, not, a, not, not common to extended spindle, but, you know, the contractor will call and say, I need a pivot for this location. Great. But I think, I got a, I think I'll have a problem, though, with the length of the, you know, I, I, got a, I have to, what, what they're saying is I have to sink this down into the floor. And we talk about it. Oh, you're adding flooring after the fact. Sure, how thick is the flooring? Yes, let's extend the spindle uh, to get you um, so that you come back to the clearance underside of the door to the top of the finished floor of what it needs to be otherwise. The H117 3 quarter particular with the 587, it's a special side load arm for inch and 3 quarter thick doors. Okay, it's a thinner arm, bottom arm as we demonstrated, or for moving the pivot. So if you want to, as I said earlier, if you want to move that door in relationship to the vertical axis of pivoting, you want to move that door, you'd use the 587 arm. I suspect that's what the client is doing here uh, with this. Or they have an inch and three-quarter thick door. Um, it's probably because they want to move the pivot point would be my guess. A thousand-pound door? I mean, what inch and three-quarter thick door is going to be up to a thousand pounds? I don't know what a quarter inch lead line door would weigh, um, seven, eight hundred pounds perhaps. I'm guessing uh, it's an educated guess. Um, but you're not going to use this pivot for a lead lined opening, uh, is the bottom line. So that's why you're going to use that. The next thing that we're going to do here now is we're going to switch to the screen view. And we are going to talk about the template, the installation instructions. We'll look at the cut sheet real quick. Uh, installation instructions for the thrust bearing. Then we're going to dive into that epic video about the uh, radius edge, and then we'll wrap it up. If you are enjoying this video, please click thumbs up or like, and also please consider subscribing to our channel. Let's move on to the rest of the video. Okay, let's dive into the installation instructions template supporting documentation. Let's first look at some images that we have posted here. That's the box. That's the contents of the box. Okay, so then we have the pivot itself, side view, your finish plate is going to go here, backside, underside, close up view of that cap for no particular reason, that's your 587 arm top view or bottom view. This arm can be flipped over. Side view. Showing that preparation for the spindle in your plate. 
Now, if this was an end view, uh, an end load arm, it would not only be wider, but that this would be solid and it would be open in here. And it obviously has to be wider so they can get screws attached to it. That would certainly be why. That's your top pivot. Your door portion, your header portion. I've had people send me details of projects where they're doing center hung pivots and they send me the plans and I'm looking at the front at the uh, can, at the plans and realizing yeah they just have drywall cased opening frames and I ask the client how do you expect to be able to attach the top pivot to drywall oh we'll make it work I just don't get that um, there's no making that work so be mindful you have to have you have to have solid material to mortise to you know attaching 5 8 drywall all in here I just I just don't see it working you know unless you created yourself a shim the thickness of the drywall so you can get down to the hopefully a wood stud your finished plates there might only be a couple more pictures to look at just one more just all the fasteners that are included okay so that will allow us to wrap up our tour of the images that we have let's look at the item itself all of this is review of what I had just said okay I will add for doors taller than 8 foot 6 go with the H345 if you've got 9 foot doors things of that nature cost more money for that longer top pin on that pivot um, that we had mentioned earlier but nonetheless all of this is right out of the catalog that I've already touched on and what I was touching on was a line by line review of those bullet points out of the cut sheet which is linked to down below now this cut sheet is the H117 3 quarter um, cut sheet down here however is the 587 variant down in here one thing to note be careful of how Rickson names their things uh, names their pivots sometimes it's an H117 you could have a 117 pivot that's a three quarter inch offset pivot let's say you can then have a 117 dash three quarter it's not the same pivot um, is the example so my suggestion if you're not sure of which one you need literally pull up the catalog and I'll show you where that is before the end of this video and be sure of the part number that you need because these guys have been making pivots for decades and their naming structure is their naming structure unless you're familiar with it it can be um, something that you unintentionally make a mistake with because you you wanted a 117 and a three quarter inch offset and but why am I getting something that's not what I wanted um, what would be an example of that let's scroll through this is the product catalog that I have I said 117 I don't know if that's going to be the most appropriate so here's a 127 dash three quarter 127 dash three quarter that's a center hung pivot jam mounted okay scrolling through the intermediate pivots to get to the offset pivots Forty-seven, five forty-seven, and then in our offset pivot area, we have, um, you know, the one seventeen that's here. It doesn't have a dash three quarter. The reason three quarter is important is because that's the typical offset, three quarter inch from the face of the door to the center of the pivot. But then they have center hung pivots where it's dash three quarter, so. I know that it's had been confusing to me thinking well it's obviously a three-quarter offset pivot no that three-quarter is part of the part number and it's a center hung and there is no offset so word of the wise just be mindful of what you're dealing with um, and refer to the catalog and to your other resources available to you, to you such as us and obviously the factory so the H117 I want to draw your attention to they show on the standard arm it's inch and five eighths and when we look at the 587 arm you can see it's inch and three eighths that's why one is okay for inch and three quarters the 587 arm and the others not that's the bottom line 
So all of this is right out of um, the catalog. This is the cut sheet. These are the bullet points we went over. Now, uh, these are instructions. Let's look at the template first. The template is the same as the instructions uh, when it comes to page one. What Rickson has done recently, relatively recently, is they've added a page two. And this, in my opinion, is a play right out of the Ives Pivot Playbook. Ives has really nice installation instructions where it's written simply in plain language all on one piece of paper. I believe that's more approachable. So if I handed you this document and said, install it, you'll say, okay, I think I can do that. If I handed you this document and said, install it, you might scratch your head. And it turns out every single thing that you need is on this page. You don't need this second page. Assuming that you've gone through to, to a neophyte, this will, this will prove problematic because to most, um, until you go through it and you become experienced, I assure you everything you need is on this one page. But to people who haven't installed these in the past, they, this page I can, I can certainly understand and agree why that would be necessary or at least extremely helpful. They, in my opinion, Rickson probably took so many calls that said, I got the template, I didn't get the installation instructions. And Rickson probably says, yes, that, that document is the installation instructions as well. Um, because it literally shows you where everything needs to go. Anyway, let's, let's look at the template first just to talk about the dimensional properties of the item. Okay, so this is a H117 3 quarter 587. You obviously want to be sure that you've got the right template. And the purpose of the template is to understand what you need to do to the door and frame. August of 2015. It's not changed at all in years. So having all of these dimensions here is in many instances simply not necessary that all of these dimensions are here. Do you really need to know the location of the screws center to center to each of them? Possibly not. If you're a hollow metal shop though you have to know because you're, you're creating a reinforcement, a drilled and tapped welded in reinforcement for that. So yes, you need all of that data just to focus in on what they're showing us. If you're doing woodworking, um, you're probably going to be using the hardware itself to template off of. Uh, but nonetheless, this gives you everything. This, start, uh, this begins to show us that radius and a note 5. The notes are always important when it comes to pivots. Note 5. Door must have removable panel to allow tightening of arm by others. Panel must be on inside of door and go from top of arm, arm to bottom of arm. So what they're saying is you're going to need to have, it's easier to look at it here in elevation, you're going to need to have a removable panel that's going to allow you to pop that out so the entire securing block can come out is what they're saying. So... Note 5, all of these other dimensions you can stare at um, and, and pull from as needed. Let's stick with the bottom arm. Shows us dimensions of the arm itself. I'm not going to go over that again. It's all there. Okay, let's continue moving on. Um, now, showing it as to what it somewhat looks like when it's installed onto or in relationship to the bottom portion. This drawing begins to put things into context, I suppose. Uh, now, here is where the business end starts coming together. Um, the question is, is where do I prep for this? Well, we know for sure, because the catalog tells us, that it's two and three quarter inch, and the template tells us, from the cased opening frame to the vertical axis of pivoting. That's super important. That's what you have to know. That is based on the 2 and 5 eighths radius that's going to be here. If you're not going to radius the edge of the door, this dimension needs to be increased because that outside corner is going to hit the jam. In fact, it's going to breach into the frame by 332nd of an inch. So the, t the part of the video that will come after this will show, will demonstrate that. But for this part, we're assuming you're putting a 2 and 5 eighths radius on there. 
So two and five eighths radius. So meaning because it's an eighth of an inch here, and and we know it's two and five eighths radius from the center here. If we use that as our radius for our circle, a two and five eighths radius, that has to be eighth of an inch. So two and three quarter from the jam to the center line. We know the length, the width of our arm. We know how to prep for that. This portion tells us how deep to prep for it. Okay. They're clearly showing us a 3 16 clearance from the bottom of the door to the floor, finished floor. That's called clearance. If you were to modify that at all, um, decreasing it, you're probably not going to squeeze much more out of it. If you were to need to increase that, you would have to correspondingly mortise your door less deeply. Okay, so if you if you were stuck with a 7 16 clearance, that's going to have to be inch and a quarter. And you can do that. Now in other pivots, they have um, docu they have a note that calls that out. Um, but just be mindful, you'll see more of the uh, of the sleeve that covers the thrust bearing. Okay, so you can you know if you were if you were in a position where you wanted the arm to be flush with the bottom of the door. We know it's inch and a half tall. We know that they're showing us 3 16 We know that the bottom of the arm to that is 1 inch. So 1 inch minus 3 16 is 13 16 Okay. Um, you're able to then, you know, in reverse fashion, figure out this dimension, 13 16 so you would then take that off of this dimension. So inch and a half minus 13 sixteenths is going to be um, 11 sixteenths. 5 eighths. Yeah, 11 sixteenths. So your mortise step should be that dimension if you were going to flush this. Actually, let's take a closer, uh, closer look at that. So this arm, yeah, the arm is inch and a half, as they're calling out. And if you were to flush it to the bottom of the door, that's how you would work the math. And that is what I was driving at earlier, that everything you need is here. There are times you just have to back into it by adding or subtracting. Uh, same logic with what you have to do at the top of the door and at the header. Well, they give us all of the dimensional properties. That's your jam, your header portion. They're showing us in elevation what you have to do uh, to, to get the door portion and the header portion mortised. You know the dimensions of the unit. They give that to you on the template for both the header portion and the door portion. You have to absolutely observe the two and three quarter dimension from the vertical axis of pivoting from the jam to that center line. So that when you drop a plumb, to, a plumb bob down the door, it's two and three quarter. It would be nice if they showed the header portion on top of the, uh, on top of the bottom portion. It'd be two and three quarter, an imaginary plumb bob. And that's everything. Now, what are they showing us here? Arm preparation, arm mortise preparation. Okay, just additional information. What that floor plate's going to look like, the thickness of the uh, of that preparation as well. Let's see. We know the plate size. six and five sixteenths, five and five thirty seconds. They don't give us the thickness that I see, but we measured that earlier at fifty thousandths. Okay, now notes. You always want to read the notes. They, they usually don't all apply. Don't scale the drawing. Dimensions given in inches with millimeters and parentheses. Suitable reinforcing by others, absolutely. The door is going to have to be prepped for this. If you're putting this into a wood door, and I was called to a job site recently, and it was a Rickson floor closer, and every time the door opened and closed, it creaked, just like our prior example. Well, what the inst original installer did was he took a Rickson, it could have been a 25, it may have been a 20, probably a 27, and mortised that arm directly to the bottom of a architectural flush wood door that was a particle board and had mostly mortised through the lumber, the rail at the bottom of the door. Well, it was the, it was the particle board. It was the movement of the wood that was causing the creaking. The bottom line is, if you're going to install this into a wood door, this needs to be solid lumber. 
you know, if you're building a style and rail door, great, solid lumber. No veneer over particle board or MDF. That's not going to work. Um, and if it's a custom wrought iron, steel, steel and glass, hollow metal, got to be properly reinforced. So in this scenario, the bottom of the door is going to have a very large welded reinforcement in here. You know, I don't know how it would be shaped from the factory. I'm not an expert when it comes to manufacturing in a hollow metal environment, but a very thick piece of steel will have to be here. I am, in, I am curious that they don't recommend a minimum thickness of reinforcement, though. I would be thinking you're dealing with at least a quarter inch thick reinforcement because all of the weight is sitting on that plate. Rickson Design Threshold available upon request. Yes, Rickson can make custom. Rickson's sister company, Pemco, can make custom uh, thresholds to fit over uh, pivots, floor closers. Door must have removable panel. We read note five already. Drill and, uh, Note six, drill and tap 832 machine screw. Uh, note six, I thought I saw it over here. Note six, right here. Um, Note six, drill and tap for 832 machine screw centered, screw by others. I am not sure why that's there. I will have to leave that as a mystery at this time and I will reach out to the factory and ask what that means, and I will amend the, the uh, extended description to explain what Note 6 means. That simply might be a holdover from the H134, the H117 3 quarter without the 587 arm. Let's pull up that template without the 587 arm and see if that's there in error because that would be your removable panel. Yeah, note six. I'm thinking the 587 arm, that is an artifact that does not belong on the actual 587 template. I'm gonna leave that as a curiosity at this point uh, as solved. So I would say that that note six does not need to be there for the 587 arm. Now. That's the template. Let's move over to the installation instructions. Page one is the same. Locate the pivot. Obviously, two and three quarter plumb bob drop down from the header, and that's going to allow you to locate where you've got to position that. Once you've created your box, the prep in the floor, whatever it is, poured concrete, most certainly, um, you get that positioned and held in place at two and three quarter. That must be observed. For floor plate application, cement case is 16th of an inch. Uh, there is no cement case with this. A cement case is a um, synthetic material box. Back in the old days, they were made of steel, and those rusted. I've seen those where they've rusted completely away. But the new, the, the new cement boxes are Krylic material. I don't, don't quote me on the pronunciation of that, but some sort of synthetic material that's obviously non-ferrous. Uh, for threshold application, cement case is set flush with the floor. Um, you know, again, there's really not a cement case. They're obviously referring to the body of the pivot. Set cement case and floor. Set the pivot in the floor and block in position. Make sure it's exactly where it needs to be and can't move. Case should be parallel with center line of door. Cement case should be level. Grout in the bottom pivot. The manufacturer really doesn't go into detail in terms of how the installer, the tradesman, the mason, the carpenter is going to get this installed, but they're giving you the general outline. Install the top pivot in the door and the header, according to the template. Center line of pivot pin should line up with the center line of the spindle. Use a plumb bob to assure accuracy. Mortis door for arm, install door and arm. Uh, yeah, we're assuming all of this is done. Mortise the arm in the bottom of the door, install it. Obviously, pre-drill your holes. These are huge screws. These are, I don't know, quarter inch. These are quarter by three, I think, 
flathead wood screws. Yeah, quarter by three. Be sure to pre-drill those. The last thing you want to do is split your door. That's that's going to be a tough one to recover from. Um, obviously, if it's uh, a steel or you know steel and glass, something or you know ornamental iron, you'll be drilling and tapping. Uh, the arm is made of steel. My magnet attests to that. I would never recommend you weld this. That'll make it tough for the next guy to come back and service the unit. Um, hang the door. So retract the top pin. That's got to get the well or not. Well, here the top pin's got to get stuck back up. That the way we demonstrated earlier. Slide the door on spindle so the bottom arm is attached. You're going to lift all that right down onto the spindle. Attach arm cap, but do not tighten. Your thrust bearing has already been put down, by the way. Your decorative cap has been put down, by the way. Um, line, um, line up the top of the door and drop that pin down. Tighten the arm end block screws. What they're saying is leave these screws loose until it's in position. Uh, drill and tap for 832 machine screw centered screw by others. Um, that, again, that must be that reference to the side here. We're not doing that on this 587. All right, that's the template and installation instructions. This comes with the thrust bearing and your spacer. That's just in the package. I've listed it here for your review. Uh, there is then a... point in time here where we can assess. We've gone over all of the supporting documentation linked to with this item. Now there is, and that's the cut sheet that's linked to, there is a link below this video as seen here to the manufacturer's page. And when you click on that, you're going to be able to pull up not only all of the ricks and parts that we sell um, by means of this horizontal navigation as seen here, but also a link to the manufacturer's full line catalog and their website. Speaking of the full line catalog, I have one from one that's over, one that is 100 years old, and I've already opened it. You can click on that link, and this is what Rickson was doing in 1920. Um, a bit clunky of a file because of its size. You could save this locally and uh, look at it there. It's just interesting to be able to go back in time and see what in the world they were making. Um, here's a here's a pivot that they have, not unlike that. Uh, well, this is um, this might be a one seventeen dash one quarter, I think is what they currently call this, and it's interesting because it's a seventeen dash quarter, is what this jam mounted offset pivot is. So it's fascinating that they basically make the same unit, and then other stuff that's here, and I probably skipped through. Uh, other pivots that they have. The point is, it's a it's an interesting document to be able to go back in time and take a look at. 1920 catalog. Okay, um, now let's, at this moment, go into the AutoCAD review, and then after that we'll just really wrap it up. If you are enjoying this video, please click thumbs up or like, and also please consider subscribing to our channel. Let's move on to the rest of the video. Okay, what we are doing here is we are looking at the Rickson H117 um, pivot. And let's take a look at the template first. All we're really going to do here is show how the door articulates through the opening, uh, but also show what sort of minimum dimension you're going to end up achieving um, as a result of the pivot point, the radius on the edge of the door and what that might uh, and what that dimension would be and what that same dimension might be if you left the door square edged so let's take a stab at doing this so we have our we have AutoCAD open here and the first thing that I know from the uh, template is that we're dealing with a two and three quarter inch dimension from the edge of the door Pardon me, two and three quarter inch dimension from the jam to the vertical axis of pivoting. Two and three quarter. Okay. And they're showing that the margin between the edge of the door and the jam is going to be an eighth of an inch. 
and it's not directly spelled out, but they're telling us that we need a 2 and 5 eighths radius. So 2 and 5 eighths radius to the edge of the door is 2 and 5 eighths. So we need a, we need a radius on the edge of the door of 2 and 5 eighths um, from the vertical axis of pivoting. But we also know that it's two and three quarter inch from the jam to the vertical axis of pivoting. So two and three quarter minus two and five eighths is our eighth of an inch. Okay, so we're just going to demonstrate what that looks like. So let's take a look here. So I have a, I just have a jam that's drawn here, and what I'm going to do is draw a line, um, and simply going to um, bring that over two and three quarter inch. And that's just really going to be my um, dimension line. It's, well, not my dimension line. It's going to show me where my vertical axis of pivoting has to be right here. So now we know that with the H117, according to the manufacturer's documentation for the H117, that the side load arm, which is the 587 arm we're working with, is designed for a inch and three quarter thick door at a minimum, inch and three quarter thick. So let's draw in a door. Um, so we'll grab a polyline and we're just going to draw We're going to go 7 eighths up in this direction. We'll just come back, you know, five and a half like it's drawn. We're going to come down inch and three quarter. We'll come back over here, okay. Five and a half. I'm going to bring it right here. Now that's going to show, that's our door. So if we were to, and this margin in here, by the way, is eighth of an inch. Our dimensions got an eighth of an inch in here, okay, which is according to the template. So now let's take this object and let's rotate it as a square edged object. To select the object that we're going to rotate. Okay. Specify the base point, which is right here. Okay, now we're going to be able to rotate this object. I have ISO turned on. Let's turn that off. So now you can see that we've got a problem here. You know, we're breaching through there by. A substantial amount by a sixteenth of an inch, even a, yeah, a sixteenth of an inch we're breaching through um, is what we're doing there. So that is where that that two and five eighths radius is going to come from. Okay, now let's trim this unit up a little bit. Let's draw a circle. And an expert at AutoCAD, I am not. That's to be sure. But we're going to leave that circle there. Then we're going to get into uh, trim. And what we're going to do is end up making this look like a door edge with a 2 and 5 eighths radius. So I'm going to clean up some of these items. I don't need my little cheat line anymore. Then let's let's group all of this. Okay, now let's get into trim. Here's trim. Let's get rid of some of these objects. Trim.
Okay. Now, And fillet is another way um, that you can go about trimming items. Yeah, we're just going through trimming our objects. Okay, so we've got what kind of looks like a door here, I suppose. Take this and we can extend it out to make it look more like a door, I suppose. Now, the next test here is to see what that door looks like as it articulates through its opening. So I'm going to um, add back my little reference line for two and three quarter. Then we're going to rotate. We've selected our object. Actually what I want to do is First, I want to select this object and group it. Then I'm going to add back my reference point. Our line's a little bit small. Okay. Now, let's rotate. Let's select the object. Specify the base point right there. Turn off our ISO. Now you can see how smoothly that goes through here. And this is obviously really helpful when you are trying to determine what sort of margin that you need. But what we're doing here is we are maintaining our eighth of an inch dimension throughout the entire cycle of the opening. And that's where two and five eighths comes from. It doesn't ever get us any closer to the door than um, eighth of an inch is the bottom line. So. As we demonstrated earlier with the square edge door, it was breaching through at least a sixteenth of an inch. So you'd really have to take that door, uh, the gap from the edge of the door, in here. Well, here actually. Yeah, that's eighth of an inch in there. You'd really have to take that and increase it to at least three sixteenths to be safe at least. And let's, I'll pause, actually, let's just take a look. Let's remove our angle there, our uh, radius edge, and then let's
just give ourselves a score edge door. Now let's measure our distance of what we have there so that we know. Okay, so that's 9 30 seconds of an inch. So that's that's pretty heavy on a quarter inch. That's that's heavy on quarter inch. So it's a little bit too large for us. Getting our door repositioned. Okay, we've now got it repositioned to 3 16 I believe. Let's take a look. Yeah, 3 16 so We've got a 3 16 gap. So let's go back and let's add our, let's rotate this. That base point is going to be um, two and three quarter from here. Okay, there's our base point. I was adding two, uh, the dimension that popped up, I was adding two and three quarter to it. So you can see that at 3 16 you won't have trouble. But the dimension in here and actually what I want to do is get the door closer to 45 degrees. So we'll undo that, rotate. Let's rotate. Select the object, okay. Our base point. One, six, three, eight, point seven, five. That did not work. Rotate, select the object. Eighteen thirty eight seventy five one six. That's what my mistake was. I put in eighteen. It's sixteen thirty eight. Okay, so let's get that rotating through there. And let's get it to 45 degree, and I'll just eyeball it rather than, well, I'll just do it correctly. That's at 45 degree. Now, let's measure what our distance is at 45 degree. I have my snap spacing on my grid giving me a little bit of trouble. So it's... And showing it at 45 was giving us 9 30 seconds of an inch, but that's really not where it's going to be closest to, to making contact. And where it's going to be closest to making contact is going to be right at about 30 degree would be my guess. Um, 9 no, less than that. Let's rotate. Base point uh, 
Yeah, about 15 degree. Looks like it's pretty close. Let's measure what that distance is. A sixteenth of an inch. R really, um, yeah, it's a sixteenth. So be mindful. Um, if you're leaving a square edge door, you'll have to have a minimum of three sixteenths just to theoretically work. And it's really not going to theoretically work with only a sixteenth. So, you know, increasing that margin to a quarter inch is probably where you'll need to be to establish uh, an eighth of an inch margin. So let's go ahead and test that, but I'll pause the video while I do that. So we've got that door moved over to a quarter inch dimension in here. Yeah, 0.25. So let's go ahead and let's rotate this. Uh, select our base point. Two and three quarter. So let's put this now over to 15 degree rotation. Let's now get in here and measure what that becomes. So it's 332nd now. And that's at a quarter inch margin. So let's move it to um, let's move it to five sixteenths and see if that'll get us to an eighth of an inch at 15 degree. Okay, we have the door moved over to 5 sixteenths margin. 5 sixteenths. Let's go ahead and rotate it now. Specify our base point. Oops. put in our 15 degree angle. Let's zoom in and let's measure. Five thirty seconds of an inch. So while we're, you know, increasing our margin, we're really not you know, doing it, you know, that's just a 30 second heavy on an eighth of an inch. So you can see how the gap to achieve basically an eighth of an inch needs to be five sixteenths of an inch here. So the bottom line is it's an eighth of an inch margin if you have a two and five eighths. Um, it's an eighth of an inch margin if you have a two and five eighths radius on the edge of your door. If you want to leave it as square edge, you're going to have to increase that to basically five sixteenths so that you still don't, you know, you're not still getting closer to the jam than an eighth of an inch. So this long video was to demonstrate, albeit a bit clunky, how that worked, and I will uh, summarize that in the title. Thank you very much. If there's any questions on this or any other pivot, please feel free to reach out to us. Thank you. If you are enjoying this video, please click thumbs up or like, and also please consider subscribing to our channel. Let's move on to the rest of the video. So I sincerely hope that the preceding 20 minutes of a deep dive into my clunky AutoCAD was not too distracting. 
but if you're able to scrub through it, you'll get to the point. And it's interesting to see how that door rotates. If you have applications with pivots where you need some help like that to determine, hey, how much room do I need to leave between the jam and the door and, you know, on the pivot side and the opposite side based on what you're doing to the edge of the door? That's where we shine. Um, clunky, you know, production quality aside, we can tell you that stuff. And that's why I think you should consider purchasing the hardware from us because we'll back it with that tech support. Speaking of tech support, Rickson does a pretty good job. I do miss the days when Mike Wells uh, was there um, in tech support. Um, the people that they have there now are also very helpful, um, but good, good quality people over at engineering and tech support and product um, consultation. You can call Rickson and say, here's what I have. What do I need? We've done a door two years ago. This client was building two doors and they were 2,500 pounds each. And believe it or not, Rickson makes a pivot for that. And they're, amazing large contraptions exceptionally expensive but you go into the Rickson world because you can call them for this strange application I don't recall where the client was using it it may have been you know an 18 foot tall 12 foot wide steel and glass structure uh, you need the right hardware for that and you obviously need the right company behind the hardware for that plan ahead pivots like that are prone to excessive lead times. I think it took 12 weeks to get those two pivots in-house, plan ahead. Um, and I think it's because many pieces have to be sourced when they're building that. You know, oh, what I mean is, Rickson doesn't make thrust bearings, okay? They buy these from someone. Uh, they don't make spacers, they buy those from someone. So putting all of these parts together, um, a lot of, Moving parts have to be in motion for it to happen, uh, you know, smoothly. Plan ahead is the point. Rickson material in terms of pivots is something that you might probably want to consider uh, because everyone is very familiar with that brand name. Also, inventory is generally very deep when it comes to pivots, but not only pivots, obviously floor closers. Other people make floor closers, but Rickson is the name that people really know. But they make overhead stops and holders. They make electromagnetic uh, door holders that you'll see in hospitals holding doors open. They have um, overhead concealed uh, door closers. They have thin style floor closers for lighter duty applications. Uh, they can do their hardware for lead lined applications, their pivots, their floor closers. They also have um, automatic door holders that would be tied into the alarm system. Um, you know, low energy you know door holders. Uh, that will allow the doors to close upon activation from the fire panel. If you have any questions on the Rickson H117-3 quarter or any other Rickson product, please feel free to reach out to us. And thank you very much. If you are enjoying this video, please click thumbs up or like, and also please consider subscribing to our channel. Let's move on to the rest of the video. And then to finish up, I did mention earlier that we would take a look at that article by Gary Katz, and the search term I use is Gary Katz Woodwork Pivot. When I search that, hidden pivot bookcase door, Gary Katz Online, and in response to the thread below from Finnish Carpentry Forum, this, this document is very old, uh, or I should say this post, and, you know, if someone said it was 20 years old, I wouldn't, I wouldn't bat an eye. It, it's likely that old. Uh, it doesn't matter its age. Its information is timeless. Um, you can also view an animated version here. That doesn't work for me. Um, that video clip. Um, and that problem that I was having was just a file association. So I've uploaded the file to YouTube and list and it's an unlisted video. So there's the animation. And what Gary Katz does is he goes through this step by step showing you everything you've got to do uh, in order to make that work. So the bottom line is I think showing this is relevant because you're dealing with a piece of hardware that is um, quite heavy to begin with. You can see the relief that he had to do here. 
You can see the compensation he had to make for the outside trim. So, as you scroll through, you're going to see a step-by-step -step walkthrough on this. Neat. If you're hanging something heavy, this uh, catalog, this uh, basically this blog post, um, is indispensable in terms of gaining the insight and wisdom of someone who makes a living doing high-end uh, finished carpentry from what I can gather. Uh, and there you go. Neat stuff. Okay, that's all. Thank you. Again, thank you for watching, and if you've enjoyed this video, please click thumbs up, please subscribe, and maybe even send the video to someone that you know. Thank you.